So hopefully you will be in for a wonderful session here where we talk about kind of interventions to close gender gaps and diversity gaps more generally from very different angles. And our first speaker is Will Doby, who joins us from Princeton University. He's a labor economist, and he has done some amazing work more generally in the labor domain. But more recently, he has been exploring something that in psychology is known as contact <coughs> theory. And Will will tell us all about it um, just now. Will, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. So my talk today is about the impact of youth service, specifically about Teach for America, which is a large nonprofit organization. So these national service organizations in the United States have roughly one million alumni. So the biggest ones would be Peace Corps, which most of us have heard about, AmeriCorps, and Teach for America, which is a, a part of AmeriCorps, actually, and how it's funded. Now, these national service programs tend to have two goals. First, they want to provide needed services to underserved communities. And there's a huge amount of academic work showing that more or less they're successful at doing this. Now, the second goal is less well evaluated. That's that they want to influence the values and careers of alumni. And the idea here is this intergroup contact theory that if you spend time with uh, people who are different than you, that's going to change your own views and hopefully make you more tolerant. Now, the problem theoretically has always been we don't know which way it will go. And most of you who have spoken with people who have served in these organizations, you always find the person who had the bad experience. So certainly I found when I talked to former Peace Corps volunteers or former Teach for America volunteers, most of them seem very positive about their experiences, but others just seem to have nothing positive to say and feel like the communities they were in are broken for reasons that were outside of their control and just that you know, everything is negative and everything is terrible. And so in this study, what we wanted to ask is, well, what experience is more, uh, more common and more prevalent? Is it this optimistic story where people are left with a sense of what's possible and that these communities are full of hardworking, smart people, or do they have this more cynical view after they finish their service? So let, let me tell you a little bit about Teach for America. It's a large nonprofit that recruits recent college grads to teach for two years in low-income, high-minority schools. Uh, so they work in about 125 districts as of now, but that's expanding over time. Now, it was founded in 1990 by Wendy Cott as part of her undergraduate thesis at Princeton. Uh, the fun little trivia is that she actually got a pretty bad grade on this because it was deemed as not realistic. Uh, <laughs> now, I serve on the, the committees that grade these now, so this is very stressful for me that I'm going to uh, dissuade some future Wendy Cop. Uh, so today, about 8,200 8, core members are serving. Uh, roughly 4,000 are entered each year. They serve for two years, and then they exit, and they can do whatever they want. 80% uh, of the students that are served by the volunteers are eligible for free lunch. Roughly 90 are either black or Hispanic. Now, most recently, Teach for All is a similar model that's being expanded to uh, take this model all over the world. Uh, so this is Wendy Kopp has actually resigned from Teach for America, and now she's working on bringing the model to other uh, communities around the world. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the experience that uh, people have if they're selected for TFA. First, you go through a five-week summer institute that sort of crams everything that they think you need to know about education into just five weeks. Typically, the people that are selected have never done anything in education before. And this is part of why they're so controversial uh, as an organization. So there's a five-week cram course. Sometimes they have additional training from the districts, but usually not. And then they're matched to whatever district and grade that they're most interested in. Uh, and then they're paid at their regular district rate, just as though they're a regular teacher. So th they really are treated as a regular teacher once they show up at the school. Now, the other thing that's interesting about TFA is this incredibly selective. So in 2013, there are 35,000 applicants for just over 4,000 slots. Uh, roughly 10% of the seniors from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton apply every year. And TFA is actually the largest employer of graduating seniors at both Georgetown and Chicago. Uh, so it's, it really is something where the magic of T, uh, Teach for America is they convince people that otherwise would have gone into consulting or eye banking that Teach for America is a valid sort of strategic thing to do for two years before you move on to something else in your life. Now, in the application process, uh, after you get through an initial phone screen and a written screen, you have a full day process where you have a sample teaching lesson, group, group discussions, written exercises, and one-on-one -on -one interviews. And what comes out of that is they calculate the single score that's how well do they think that you're going to do in the classroom. Do they think you're going to be successful? And there's a score below which you're very unlikely to be selected. And that's the natural experiment that we're going to exploit in this study. Essentially, if you have a score that's on this negative range, you're very unlikely to be selected for Teach for America, and you're very unlikely to have that experience. 
Once you score just to the right of that range, you then are very likely to be selected. And so, in essence, what we're going to do is compare the outcomes of people a couple years later who are just on either side of this threshold and ask, well, do they look different? And the underlying assumption is they wouldn't have been that different in the absence of being selected for Teach for America. There's really nothing going on in this uh, application process that would select people that are radically different just on either side of this cutoff in any given year. Okay. So, the hard part of this study was we had to go find all these people. Uh, so we worked with Teach for America, and we got data on all their applicants from 2002 to 2007. And then we reached out to them and asked them as many questions as we could come up with. Uh, so I'll go through the questions in a minute, but at a high level, first we ask about people's background just to get a sense of who they are. Then we ask about their educational beliefs. Essentially, do they still believe in the Teach for America mission, or have they kind of soured on the goals that uh, the uh, organization has? Next, we ask, well, what about in practice? Are you still in education? Are you planning on staying in education? Or is this a two-year pit stop, and now you want to move on to other things? Teach for America always claims that people, that this helps people stay in education the rest of their lives, but that's never been tested before. Third, we ask about people's political, er, uh, I left out political outcomes, but we do ask about uh, politics. So we ask, are you more liberal about spending, particularly on spending, for these types of communities. So are you more willing to support education spending, for example? Uh, and does that change with your service? And then finally, we ask about racial beliefs. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit more how we do this, but we're gonna get both explicit and implicit uh, beliefs, especially when it comes to black-white preferences. Now, the survey uh, we conducted in 2010, to encourage people to take it, we had a $5,000 random drawing. Uh, one little nice thing is we also allowed people to uh, preemptively say they wanted to donate the money if they won. This is also to get at whether Teach for America volunteers are, are more likely to uh, A, donate their money, and B, donate their money to Teach for America. Uh, there's not big effects, but it did turn out the person who won did donate their money to charity. So, uh, so that's good, I suppose. Uh, and then, you know, we did the usual uh, set of strategies to get people to respond. And we got a relatively high response rate overall, uh, about 30%, and it's even around the cutoff, which was our, our big goal for the nerds in the room. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about the questions and the, the interesting stuff. So the education belief questions, we're really trying to get at the idea, do you still believe in what Teach for America is about? Do you think that the achievement gap is solvable? Do you think that if we just work hard enough in these communities that we can make a difference? Or after two years of trying, are you convinced this is no longer possible? All right, so this is trying to get the idea that after two years of actually doing the work, maybe you're energized, maybe you've, you've seen what you can do, or maybe you've seen what you can't do, and you just think this is impossible, uh, no one's gonna be able to make a difference. So that's what these questions are really about. Next, we ask, what are you actually doing? It's one thing to say that you believe in education. Are you actually doing it? So we ask what they're doing. Uh, then we ask about redistribution, redistribution and such. And then finally, we ask about the racial bias, as I mentioned. So here, the implicit beliefs are measured using what's called an implicit association test. Uh, the idea here is, uh, this is a test designed by psychologists. And uh, it's supposed to measure your implicit beliefs under the idea that most people are not gonna tell you, you know, well, I don't really like people that are different than me, or I don't like this particular group. This is supposed to get our implicit biases by seeing how quickly can we associate good and bad concepts with people of different races, or faces that uh, represent different races. And the idea is that the longer it takes you to associate, you know, a good phrase with a black face, that shows that you're more implicitly biased against blacks. And these measures seem to have pretty good validity in other studies, so we're gonna use them here. Uh, explicit measure that we're going to use is the modern racism scale. There's very little that's modern about it. Um, it's going to pick up the kind of most egregious sort of stated, you know, racism that you might think of. Uh, so it's things like, do you think that uh, Asians are smarter than whites on average? Do you think that blacks are smarter than Asians? And it kind of goes through the gamut of questions like that. Uh, these are not subtle. Um, if you're a smart person, you pick up very quickly what we're asking about. And so keep that in mind as, as you think about what we're picking up. Uh, this really is people who are willing to say, at least in an anonymous survey, yeah, that group is just not as smart as this other group. Uh, that's what we're gonna pick up. Where the implicit test is gonna be something a little bit more subtle, is the idea. Okay, so let's go through the results. All these are framed in terms of the effect of actually serving. So if we pick someone who's otherwise the same, but we send them for two years into these communities, what changes about them? So for, for faith and education, we see big effects throughout. Uh, these are in terms of percentage points. 
And if it's filled in, that means it's statistically significant. So we have a fairly high degree of certainty that this isn't just due to random chance that we found it. There really is something real there. So all of them are pretty big. So first we asked, can poor children compete with more advanced children? We see about a 45 percentage point change in the probability that you say, yeah, poor children really can compete with advanced children, you know, as long as they have the right educational system. Same with the achievement gap is solvable. We see about a 35 percentage point change. Uh, the fraction of minorities that people think should graduate from college, that goes up by about 20 percentage points. People that believe teachers are the most important determinant of success, that goes up by about 35 percentage points. Uh, so all these are kind of going up by somewhere between 20 and 50 percentage points. So people come out of their experience saying, yeah, I really can change the world. You know, these two years left me much more optimistic about what I can do and what people like me can do. So Teach for America was happy about that. Next, we asked, well, what are you actually doing? You have these beliefs that you can be more, uh, that you can be helpful to the world. Are you doing something about it? The answer is largely yes. So the probability that someone is employed in a K-12 school goes up by about 35 percentage points. So this is, at the moment we surveyed them, they're actually working in a school versus they wouldn't have been if they hadn't been selected for Teach for America. Employed in education more broadly, we even find a slightly bigger effect because many of these people have moved into other types of roles, be it a vice principal or being an administrator in some other uh, way, but they're still involved in education. Uh, the one place we don't find an effect is we thought we were being very clever in figuring out whether people would prefer teaching to finance, which people have always claimed is the big counterfactual. Uh, we don't change people's preferences at all with that. But we do make people much more willing to work in an urban school over a suburban school. So conditional on being interested in teaching, they're now willing to work in kind of the hardest hit areas or the areas where they feel like they can have the biggest effect. Conversely, there's essentially no effect at all when it comes to political beliefs. So serving in Teach for America doesn't make you more liberal. It doesn't make you think we should spend more on any particular thing. Uh, no matter how we ask these questions, there really is just no effect. So while we make people more optimistic about what they can do, we don't seem to be changing what they think the national priorities should be. So we're not you know, changing people to you know, fight for one party over another or fight for particular uh, priorities in the national budget over another priority. And finally, we look at the uh, racial bias. So I was actually surprised that we found any effect at all when it came to the explicit measures, but there is a 15 percentage point uh, 15 percentage point change in the probability that you express these kind of very overt, explicit uh, racist preferences if you s serve and teach for America. And again, you should keep in mind who these people are. These are smart, supposedly liberal people from these top schools, and so they're already mostly saying the right thing. Uh, so the fact that there's any effect at all, it, to me, is, is pretty amazing. Now, with the implicit tests, uh, we find an even bigger effect. So there's about a 0.3 standard deviation effect. Uh, so people are just much more likely to show up on these implicit measures as being much more tolerant after they serve and teach for America. Um, so again, it kind of fits this narrative that on average, people come out of this experience being much more tolerant than they otherwise would have. So to sum up, you know, what do the effects look like in comparison? You have very, very big effects on people's faith in education and involvement in education and then still very big but slightly more modest effects on their racial tolerance. So on the whole, the story seems to be that people are having positive experiences. They're not ending up in the kind of cynical way that, that sometimes we run across, that people really are leaving their uh, national service experience thinking that the world can be uh, saved in some way. So thank you. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, we have 15 minutes per speaker, and if the speaker speaks less long, then we have time for questions. Otherwise, please hold your questions, take notes, and hold your questions until the end. Our next speaker is Vera Miranova. She is currently visiting the Kennedy School, is a political scientist and economist by training, and works with uh, groups with extreme beliefs. I have to hold both and I feel like a king, you know? <laughs> Can you hear me? Which way should I hold it? No, I, I don't think. No, 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 this is not. Ah, it's recording. So I actually have to speak loud. Um, okay, so we just heard a presentation. Uh, Will told us about what happened, you know, how to increase tolerance. Now I'm going to talk about if you don't do that, what's going to happen, right? 
So in particular, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, the effect of exposure on the violence on time preferences. Um, so uh, that's a joint work with Alex Simas from Carnegie Mellon University and Michael Kuhn from University of Oregon. We all heard about uh, costs of war. For example, human costs, you know, people getting killed. Economic costs, direct loss of capital, you know, stuff is getting destroyed. But there are also behavioral costs we know less about. So impatience and decision quality is going to be an example of those. So motivation for this paper is first to show that the negative effects of exposure on violence on impulsivity. But it would be just half work if we don't at least try to, to see how to fix this problem. So in the second step, we're showing that um, effect of <coughs> delay, um, positive effect of delay on impulsivity decision making. Uh, decision cost of violence. There is a literature, previous literature, talking about effect of trauma events uh, on preferences. And now there is an increasing amount of literature coming out about particular violence and decision making. For example, they are looking at, again, decision quality, uh, risk perception, altruism, and so on. On the other side, we have a broad literature on time discontinuity and impulsivity. For example, we know that great impulsivity negatively affects human capital. So we're going to test, how in the field settings, effect of delay on patience and impulsivity. And in particular, how this delay helps the most vulnerable to this problem people, people who experienced uh, violence. Design of the study is the following. So we partnered with a store in Bukavu. It's a Buddha town in Congo on the border with Rwanda. Uh, why did we have to go that far to do this study? I mean, first of all, because they're exposed to violence, but you know, we have a lot of people here exposed to violence. But the most important thing is that pe people who live there, they have transaction. There is uh, no difference in transaction cost between today versus future because it, people don't have, um, for example, electricity, so they have to go to the store every day. So for them, you know, they do the same task every day. Uh, so we partnered with a store, um, and uh, it's a local store. So people are also familiar with the stuff. So there was nothing new in this experiment. Like they did not feel that they're in an experiment. So when people came to the store, they were getting coupons that they could redeem for the bag of flour, you know, to cook bread, and that's the main food they consume. And they have options to redeem it sooner for a sm uh, smaller reward, or wait and redeem it later for a bigger reward. And people were in different groups. So for example, in immediate treatment, they were allowed to start redeeming it right away. Or in delayed treatment, they had to wait, like we forced them to do so. So this is the settings, usual pictures from the field, a usual store, hole in the wall type of store. <coughs> so uh, people in this uh, area, they are really exposed to violence. And they're exposed to indiscriminate violence. And it's proved by, you know, the statements from UN, State Department, basically all international organizations saying that it was like as random as it goes because actually war there was like for the last 20 years. But we also relied on a survey methods from other studies uh, to make a scale of exposure to violence. And one third of the participants, they were directly exposed to violence. Think about wounded and raped. And uh, two thirds, they were indirectly exposed. They were not not directly exposed. I mean, because like everyone was like indirectly exposed, living there, but they they didn't have a direct exposure. So the design. So people came. We gave them this coupon, and we asked them, okay, you could give it to me right back immediately, and I'm gonna give you one bag of flour in immediate treatment, or you could go home with this coupon, come back tomorrow, and I'm gonna give you two bags of flour and so on, you know, five days. So, you know, you're getting more if you wait. In a delayed treatment, it was the same setup, except they didn't have an option to start redeeming it today. So they were literally forced to go home with it and then decide. So now let's go directly to results. Um, 
apparently people who were exposed to violence, they were more likely than people who were not exposed to violence to redeem coupon the day they got it, like immediately. So literally, like I was giving them coupon, they were giving it to me back. So people who were exposed to violence, they were more impatient compared to people who were not. But in a delayed treatment, when I force them to literally go home and think about it rationally, you know, like actually think about it, they were not different from people who were not exposed to violence. So uh, <coughs> in a summary, exposure to violence affects people in, a w uh, in terms of their time horizon, in terms that they, it makes them less impatient. But making, uh, forcing them to delay their decision helps to solve this problem. It makes them identical to people who are not exposed to violence. And <coughs> this, uh, this result could have a possible policy implications, for example, for humanitarian aid distribution. But also we know some private companies that are actually using this intuition. For example, Walmart. You know that right now Walmart has a policy that you could do a tax um, refund right there in a store. And they give you this credit on your, you know, Law, uh, inside Walmart b account before you actually get this refund to spend right away. So you could uh, guess that it leads to less you know, efficient decision making, especially among the most vulnerable category of people. Those, for example, exposed to violence. And violence here could be not just war, but domestic violence or war veterans. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if you'd like to ask any questions right now, um, we have about five minutes for questions before we move on to the next talk. Anything in particular about this talk that you'd like to discuss? Okay, otherwise we'll move right ahead. And we have Evan, who I introduced before, who is joining us from MIT and is gonna talk about his work on making diversity work in diverse groups with various demographic backgrounds. So uh, thanks for coming to the session. I'm going to be sort of double clicking on some of the issues that I talked about earlier and I'll uh, share data from a few different studies that we've collected in a paper that is now in press looking specifically at this uh, key factor of numerical representation. So um, what we know from past research is that stigmatized social groups uh, face a number of social and structural obstacles to success in organizational life. And uh, these obstacles are compounded by being represented in very small numbers. So uh, being represented in very small numbers is associated with things like lower performance, higher rates of turnover, uh, lower job satisfaction, lower levels of engagement. And so the question becomes from the perspective of scholars but also sort of practitioners, um, what is it that organizations can do to create conditions where uh, groups have sort of a more equitable chance to thrive? So one uh, route that uh, organizations may take is to employ what I would sort of regard structural interventions. That is uh, a, a very common one to help groups that are represented in very small numbers is to try to increase numbers, right, to uh, use affirmative action policies or other initiatives uh, involved in getting more bodies into the workplace to offset some of these costs and obstacles. Other policies uh, associated with stemming turnover uh, could be creating sort of things like affinity groups, training and sponsorship, flexible work arrangements. Um, the perspective I'm going to take today is that uh, many of the things are important uh, and may have uh, a sort of a key role in making this work, but uh, what's, come, uh, what's become clear with recent research is that there's also this cultural avenue that becomes really, really important. And in particular, how organizations specifically articulate their views towards differences and diversity, how they are, prov what framework they are providing people with to say, here's how you should think about why different people are in the workplace, here's how we think about working together, and this is why uh, we believe in this, and here's our vision. This is a critical opportunity to give, sort of make sense for people what diversity is and sort of why it's important. Um, as I alluded to earlier, the past research sort of suggests that there are these two really overarching ways to construe this. 
and taken in sort of an organizational context here. One is really saying, yes, there are differences. Let's talk about them. Let's celebrate them. Let me show you how differences help decisions, how they help us uh, cater to a more diverse marketplace, how they make people sort of more satisfied and engaged at work, how they increase sort of the culture, the inclusiveness of the culture. Um, there's another type of approach uh, that sort of takes a very different perspective, which is to say that we value creating a workplace that first and foremost is fair, provides everyone with an equal opportunity to succeed. We look beyond those differences. What's important is the fact that everyone knows that they earn their spot. They're here because they are uh, one of sort of the best. And so you can see there, as I said before, there is a tension between these approaches. I don't want to leave you with the sense that you have to be in one or the other, but just imagine that you could be high on both, high on one, low on the other. And so the question becomes, uh, what should we be focusing on? To, to what extent should organizations be sort of focusing on one or the other? So as I alluded to before, this is the question that has dominated more than a decade of research in this domain. And I don't think this is going to provide fruitful results. Um, the literature, of which I, admittedly I'm a contributor to, um, has uh, produced, uh, I think, in isolation, not a, a lot of important results, but not bringing us any closer to saying um, there is one uh, approach that is going to work across all contexts for all groups. So as we sort of move beyond this one-size-fits-all framework, I'm going to start talking about this critical question of, OK, well, who is being targeted? Which groups are being targeted? And specifically, let's look at the numerical representation of those groups and how that can really interactively uh, affect how these diversity approaches work and whether they will be effective. So just to give you a very quick theoretical background, why would it matter if a group's representation is low versus moderate? Uh, in an organization in terms of what happens when you bring attention to differences. So what we know from past research is when groups are representation is very, very low, like less than 5% or even individuals are in solo status in a classroom or in a workplace setting, the co the, there are uh, very proximate concerns about standing out and feeling the weight of representing your group with every comment. Um, and uh, the need for belonging and for a sense of equality and fairness is particularly high. Whereas when groups representation is moderate, it's not like those things don't matter, but there is an increased desire for recognition of differences. Yes, we're here. I'd like to be recognized, appreciated, and I'd like there to be a case articulated for why that's important. Okay? So the needs may differ between these groups. As sort of a test case, an initial test case for this broader theoretical idea, we're looking at uh, racial minorities, primarily African Americans, and uh, women in professional settings. And the reason is these groups are both targeted by diversity approaches, so they're practically a good fit, but also their representations differ to a great deal in these contexts. Uh, racial minorities are typically in very, very small numbers, whereas white women are sometimes almost uh, half of organizations at at least a sort of associate levels. So uh, the very quick hypotheses that I, uh, that I will get out you are fairly straightforward. For white women, we're expecting better outcomes in terms of what we're measuring here, uh, performance, persistence, in response to this value and difference approach. Whereas with racial minorities, we're expecting better outcomes with uh, in response to the value and equality approach. So how are we measuring better? Uh, we're going to look at one firm-wide indicator, which is going to be rates of attrition at big law firms. And the second is within controlled laboratory experiments, we're going to be looking at performance and persistence on uh, a behavioral task, although I only brought the performance data uh, given uh, time today. All right, three questions that I'm going to quickly touch upon. Is there real-world evidence even consistent with this idea? Uh, two. Does this mean that we can tailor diversity approaches to boost performance of different groups? And is it really about numbers that explains uh, why these things occur? So the first study took almost a year to run. Uh, this was a, a very big undertaking. We took the diversity statements from 151 of the biggest law firms in the United States, and we, had, uh, we trained coders to basically content code them uh, in such a way that uh, allowed us to gauge their relative emphasis on this value indifference versus value inequality approach. 
And then we used those relative weightings of how much they're focusing on one approach versus the other, or both, to try to predict uh, real-world uh, attrition data that we uh, took from Building a Better Legal Profession, which is a, a nonprofit organization that helps law students figure out where they want to uh, work after grad school. Um, so we have basically attrition data broken down by race and gender, and we have these emphases. So the first thing I want to show you is that when we just ran this through a multidimensional scaling, so basically this is what coders coded of our different items that were supposed to be associated with differences versus equality. And when we look at this, there are two relatively clean clusters, though not perfect, suggesting that our theorized notions of there being these two contrasting approaches to diversity bear out in what uh, the coders uh, show us. I'm just going to skip over this in the interest of time. So let's now look at what happens when we use those emphases to predict rates of attrition. I'm going to show you two different regression models. The outcome measure on the left is the rate at which women associate level attorneys are leaving the firm as compared to men. And on the right side, it's the rate at which racial minorities are leaving as compared to whites. So we have a bunch of, uh, of control variables which populate the first four rows of, of this. But what you'll see here highlighted is that the more firms' diversity statements are focusing on the value in differences, the lower the rates of attrition are of women as compared to men. The more firms are arguing for the importance of equality and fairness irrespective of differences, the lower the rates of attrition among racial minorities. So what about trying to run this in a controlled laboratory experiment where we can get a causality? So to do this, we, use, we pay an online survey panel to get us working professional uh, African-American men, women, and white women. These are late 30s, everyone is college educated, working US citizens. We basically tell them we need their help to evaluate website messages. They all believe they're helping a, a, a one fictitious company, Redstone and Company. And we basically randomly assign them to look at either a prototypical value indifference or value inequality statement. And immediately after, we ask them to complete uh, an anagram task. And you may be asking yourself, why an anagram task? This turns out to be a really good behavioral indicator of uh, both persistence and performance. Scram Rescrambling the letters of these words to figure out new words is hard, but it also requires a certain amount of just grit and persistence to keep struggling through failed attempts to do this. So this is sort of what we uh, employed here. What we find here uh, on the y-axis is performance, the number of anagrams solved. Both for African-American men and women, we see better performance in response to the value and equality message than the difference message. But interestingly, for white women, we see the opposite pattern. They're performing better in response to the difference message as opposed to the equality message. This is interesting. Again, this is the exact same message. They're responding in very, very different ways. Why do these performance effects emerge? So I'm not going to share with you the stats on this, but the mechanism data that we have uh, has to do with the very big difference in representation-based concerns that these two groups express. Concerns about standing out, concerns about having to represent your race or represent all women, the notion that if things don't work out, it will be blamed on everyone for your group. In short, black uh, men and women express much higher concerns of this type than do uh, white women in this context. And the final uh, experiment, which is really critical for testing our, uh, our argument about the role of numerical representation, essentially directly manipulates whether uh, black men and women versus white women expect to be 5% or 40% of an organization. The rest of the study is exactly the same. Here's what we find with the same dependent measure. This looks confusing, but I'm going to walk you through it. So the first two bars of each of these three clusters are what happens when groups think they're 5% in the value and difference versus equality message. And the second two bars in each of these three clusters are what happens when groups think they're in 40%. So what you'll see in the first two bars in each of these clusters, in general, we see that for all groups, the value and equality approach is more effective when groups think they're in very small numbers. It's not quite like that for white women. It is more so for black uh, women and men. But perhaps the most consistent data is, which speaks to the power of the structure, when groups think they're 40 percent, when all groups prefer the value and difference message. This is really important. These are really important data because they suggest that it's not just something inherent about these messages that 
African Americans like or white women like. It's something about the concerns that bubble up from being in different structural conditions of five versus 40 percent, what those are sort of proxies for. So what does this mean? Well, if nothing else, what I'd like to convince you of, it means is that one size does not fit all. Um, we have uh, evidence both from uh, experimental evidence and correlational evidence in the field um, that the exact same well-intentioned promotional diversity statement can have the opposite effect uh, depending on who's targeted. So I think this is important because this suggests another tool in organizational's arsenal in parallel with efforts to increase representation that kind of crafting and tailoring cultural context to meet and to adhere to people's concerns in that environment to provide them with an opportunity to, uh, to thrive. So I think the, the most obvious practical implication and biggest problem uh, that we're sort of now working on is this issue of, well, one key implication is before organizations sort of enlist a certain approach, they should figure out who they're targeting. Um, the, the complexities then become, well, what happens when organizations are trying to uh, target diversity and inclusion initiatives uh, within organizations that are comprised of groups of different numbers and percentages, et cetera? Ha what happens when we try to sort of emphasize both approaches? And that's sort of where the, the current work is right now. And that's where I'll end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evan. Any questions for Evan at this point? Yes, right there. And are we trying to get the mic over here as well? So right, let me. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Marina Oberholzer from Switzerland. Um, I find this very interesting, you know, the different approaches that depend on uh, kind of what percentage of the population the group is represented at. One pattern that we see in uh, financial services, for example, is that when you have organizations that have the lower levels, you have an equal split of the genders, right? Uh, so you have 50-50, roughly, when people start working. But the further up you go in the kind of hierarchy in these organizations, then women start dropping off, and at some point you get to like 10%, which is definitely below the 40 so in your work and your research, have you looked at this pattern? And um, I don't know if it's relevant at all, but would you have any suggestions on how to use these tools to kind of deal with the fact that the same group, so in this case, for example, white women, may be, might be a majority or over 40% at one level, but they are also the very small minority at a different part in, in the organization. So although they're all the same, they're also different. Uh, so I think there's definitely tension. So I think it's a great question. So the, the, the immediate answer is we don't yet have data to speak to that. But I can, I, now I will now speculate about to sort of what I think. Uh, I can tell you sort of my two cents about what I think about that. So I think that one big implication is that these approaches need to be tailored, and they are fluid over time. So you could imagine we focused on sort of associate level African Americans and white women. But, the, but those percentages can, you know, we plop in different groups, the percentages can change. So even if you looked at associate level like STEM, science, technology, engineering, uh, math, women are in very low numbers there. So you could imagine them perhaps responding more like African Americans in these data. Similarly, at executive level positions, women may respond more positively to sort of uh, a, an equality message that is credentialing their competence and qualifications that they earned a spot. It wasn't because there was sort of precondition to needing a woman at that level. So I can imagine, in short, the equality message being more effective for white women at a higher level where they're represented in much smaller numbers than when they enter the firm. The practical implications of how to sort of implement that like on a basis where these messages sort of fluidly change or, or what policies are actually triggering uh, them to, to sort of think about the organization seeing them uh, as members of their social group versus um, just highly meritorious, qualified individuals who earn their position. How to strike that balance, how to change it over time, I don't have a great answer for, but, but I, I think the short answer is they, they can't be stagnant based on our data. So if they were 50-50 and it changes to 10% now, um, I think the message, their concerns will change in terms of at least at that level, and thus the messaging needs to change as well. Yeah. Okay, so basically, be aware of these two different approaches and kind of see how you're approaching the groups of the gender as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I think these messages match concerns differently, and so I, what I'm saying is we don't really know. Yet. This this research is in press about a week ago, so it's very very fresh. And the benefit is that I can say I don't know the answer of <laughs> yet of, of how that will be implemented, but that would be my intuition. Yeah. Yes, I have one more question. Yes, this lady right here. Fazal from the OECD. Uh, thank you very much. Really interesting uh, uh, piece there. But um, I had a question. Um, through your research, or even if, if you didn't look at this, I wondered about your insights about what was the reaction um, or response from white men to the two different um, diversity strategies themselves? In terms of like whether they thought it was um, valuing difference or valuing equality, what was the what, what what was their reaction? Well, so in the studies where we have sort of more open-ended responses and we ask them about this, um, we had. Uh, Similar preferences were similar to what the performance data looked like. So um, they, I mean, you have to understand in the law firm data, similar to these other professional services, everyone is super qualified. Many of them went to elite schools, extremely high performers, and so they've everyone has sort of earned a position. And the notion now that an organization will, even from a well-intentioned perspective, say, "Hey, we really care about differences. Differences is all about uh, why we're here and why we look for people." That actually is very threatening, what we heard in the open-ended responses to people, because it's, they see that as giving other people ammunition to question why they were there in the first place, that they didn't really earn the spot as others did. So, um, but the, the cautionary thing is that um, you have to really believe that the organization cares about equality. It can very easily, um, there can be slippage into sort of blanket, cookie-cutter EOs or statements that just sound like, Bullshit, excuse me. You know, so so I think there is a way to authentically communicate it, um, but if it's not authentic and other research has shown it can backfire. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to Linda Babcock, and I introduced Linda before. She joined us from Carnegie Mellon University, has done amazing work on gender negotiation, but today is actually going to talk about new work of hers, which takes a somewhat different perspective on not so much what we ask for, but rather what we give. Linda. I don't know if I can do this correctly. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about one particular barrier to women in the workplace, and that is how people spend their time at work. Um, and I want to thank my amazing co-authors. So there's been a lot of work to uncover why women don't advance at the same rate as men in organizations. We have biases, we have different career interruptions, choices of, of, of majors in college, competitiveness, and then I've looked at differences in negotiation. But one thing that we are investigating now is how people spend their time at work. So let me give you an example of how this research started. So this is a typical day for me. It's quite sad. Um, I'm on the IRB. I've got a leadership committee going talking to students. So I talk to a reporter. I've run a, a program called the Academy. I actually get to do research for an hour here. Um, I work on a review, and then I have a student meeting. And so the uh, tasks in black are what we call non-promotable tasks, and the task in red are what promotable tasks. That's how I'm evaluated, is really on the basis of my research. Now, I sit across the hall from George Lowenstein, who many of you know, and this is his day. He is hunkered down in his office all day doing research. He goes to a seminar and talks to students, but, but otherwise he's just in there doing research. So I thought this was very interesting um, and uh, I tried to think about why our schedules were different. And they, they really are because he is spending his time doing promotable tasks. So what is that? In our jobs, it's doing research. Non-promotable tasks are things like sitting on the IRB. Now, here's the qualities of non-promotable tasks. They're good for the institution, right? Someone has to sit on the IRB. They're discretionary. You could or could not sit, right? Someone asks you to, you could say no. Anyone, really, who, who does research with human subjects could sit on the IRB. It doesn't have to be me. And this last one is really important. Everyone wants the IRB to happen, but each person would prefer that someone else did it. That's what I call a non-promotable task, OK? So there is some evidence on uh, the fact that women spend more of their time on non-promotable tasks. Uh, it's not just George and I, but that women in universities spend more time on university committees, uh, working with students. Um, uh, and, and these uh, different departmental uh, uh, kinds of committees. So this is not what we're studying. This is a, a pretty well-established fact that there are differences in how men and women spend their time at work. What we're trying to uncover is why. Uh, 
And we call it the demand and supply of non-promotable tasks. On the demand side, we're asking the question, are women asked more than men to, be, uh, to do these non-promotable tasks? That is, so do people ask me to be on the IRB and not George? Um, and on the supply side, uh, are women more likely than men to say yes? When asked to do this task, are women going to say yes? Uh, and so in thinking about this, um, I actually asked George if he had ever been asked to be on the IRB, and he said no. <laughs> and then he added, of course, and if they asked me, I'd say no. Okay, <laughs> so this is what we're studying. Um, we got data from UCLA, and apparently there is a committee, which Craig Fox chairs, it's called the Committee on Committees such a thing. Um, and as a chair of the Committee on Committees, he got to get, try to get people to volunteer to be on the Faculty Senate. Uh, the Faculty Senate, uh, people who uh, may, may not know, it's definitely a non-promotable task. <laughs> and he sent an email to, 30, to every single faculty member at UCLA and said, hey, we'd like you to join the Faculty Senate, would you? And we got the data from him, uh, and it seems that more women are agreeing um, to be on the Faculty Senate. About three times as, as many women uh, said yes to um, this request to be um, on the Faculty Senate. So that's some evidence on the supply side. Women are more likely to say yes. But you might just say, oh, maybe women like to be on the Faculty Senate. Well, we wanted to test this in a cleaner situation in the lab to really try to tease out alternative explanations for uh, this. So here we have the following task, and this is called, uh, for those of you who um, know the economics liter literature, a threshold public goods game. So here's how it works. Imagine we're all in this room and we're sitting in front of computers. We tell people, you're going to play 10 rounds of an exercise, and each round you're going to be matched with two other people in the room. You're not going to know who they are, but you're going to be in this, in this group of three now. Okay, so what happens? In each of ten rounds, the group needs to decide whether or not someone is going to volunteer. And what a volunteer means is they, they press a button and says, yes, I'll do it. So what are they volunteering to? It's whether they're going to con contribute. Okay. If no one contributes, if, the t if they have two minutes to decide if they're going to contribute, if nobody in the group of three decides to press the button, everybody gets a dollar. Okay? But if one person decides to press the button and say, yes, I'll do it, that person gets $1.25, that's good, but the other two people get two, two dollars. So imagine if you're sitting there, the clock is ticking down for two minutes. If no one volunteers, everybody gets a dollar. And so you're kind of thinking, oh, please, 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 someone else press the button. Okay? Because you're going to get two dollars if someone else presses it rather than you. So what we were looking at is who presses the button. Okay, there's no skill in being able to press the button. Women are just as good as men at pressing this button. <laughs> uh, it's like, all right. uh, and so who does it? Um, I'll also say, again, you don't know who you're matched with, and you're matched with a different group each of the 10 periods. So it's not like you're playing some dynamic game where you're trying to influence people's future behavior. You're randomly rematched with others in the room. Okay, so that's the, that's the task we're looking at, and we're trying to see who presses the button. Well, women are better at pressing the button than men here, as it, as it turns out. Um, this is the, um, for each of the 10 rounds, going this way, the probability that a woman invests, makes the decision to invest versus, uh, versus a man. And you can see for every period, uh, the, the um, m women are more likely to agree to volunteer. Okay? So, why does this happen? You might think, well, maybe women are just more altruistic. So they're willing to take one for the team. But we had a different explanation. What we reasoned is that there was this focal point that people are expecting women to contribute, and so um, men don't have to. And if everyone shares that view, this is what we'll get in equilibrium, is that women will be more likely to contribute. Okay? So how to test this uh, is that we decided to run single sex groups. So now, in instead of a room looking like this in the experiment, it was all women. Okay. Now, how are women going to behave differently in this study, if our hypothesis is correct? Women are going to be happy to see other women in the room. They're going to feel like their contribution maybe isn't so critical. Because I see a lot of other women in the room, I think some other woman is going to, uh, to contribute. So we expect women's rate of contribution to fall in going from a mixed sex environment to a single sex. But imagine men. Before, men were in a mixed group, and so they're waiting for women to contribute, but now they're sitting in a group of all men, and they're thinking, oh boy, I'm going to have to step up to the plate now and contribute. So we're expecting men's 
participating, men's investing, to go up from a mixed sex to a single sex environment. Now notice, if it's altruism, we shouldn't get those results. We should get people behaving exactly the same. All right, so what are the um, contribution rates now? They're exactly equal. That is, both men and women are contributing now in the single sex environment at exactly the same rate. Now, if you want to see the data from the previous experiment laid on top of this, basically, women in the, in the mixed sex environments is the dashed pink line. The men in the mixed sex uh, is the dashed blue. And so what you can see is, indeed, the blue line shifts up for men and the pink line shifts down for, uh, for women. And so we're seeing that it's not some fixed preference for contributing or helping out the group, but it is driven by expectations that others will or will not uh, contribute. OK, so that's some evidence on the supply side. It's, it's being driven by expectations. We wanted to look at the demand side, and so we changed the study in around, uh, uh, around, and now we added a fourth person. So it's the exact same setup. But now there's a fourth person in the group, and that first fourth person can't contribute themselves. The other three people are playing the game. But that fourth person can send a message to one of the other group members and say, will you contribute? OK? So let's say that my group are the three of you. I, as the fourth member, can, can send a message saying, hey, will you, not you, <laughs> will you, will you contribute? All right? And the question is, who do you ask? And in this study, we had pictures. So you could see who your group member was. So you get, you get something like this. Uh, who do you ask con to contribute? Okay. So when there is a woman and two men, 40% of the time the woman is asked and 30% and each, each of the other men. And you might say, well, people ask her because she's focal. You know, how do I choose between the two men? Um, and so you might ask, what happens when there is a group of two women and one man? Well, He's not asked <laughs> very much. It's, it's again, uh, the women are being asked more. Okay, so that's some evidence on the demand side. Now, are people correct? That is, was it smart of them to have asked the woman rather than the man? Well, when you ask a woman in this game, she actually says yes 75% of the time. So it's pretty smart to ask a woman. And it's less smart to ask a man because they only contribute 50% of the time. Okay, so what do we learn from all this? We have some field evidence and some experimental evidence about the demand and supply of these non-promotable tasks. Okay? Um, on the supply side, uh, the experimental evidence suggests and the field evidence suggests that women are more likely to volunteer, especially in mixed sex groups. On the demand side, people are asking women to volunteer and do these more than, uh, more than men, and perhaps that is driven by the fact that women are going to say yes. The net outcome is that women do no more non-promotable tasks than men. And what do we do about this? Well, you could think of there being two types of interventions, an individual interventions and organizational interventions. So either we target the supply side or the demand side. So should we encourage women just to say no? And say, no, I'm not going to do this non-promotable task. Well, we might do that, but there is some research by Madeline Heilman that suggests that um, when people are asked to help others, Men get credit if they say yes, but women get penalized. Okay. And so it may not be a good thing to suggest to women that they ought to start declining these non-promotable tasks. There may be backlash against them for saying no, because it is normative for a woman to say no. I mean, I'm sorry, to say yes. Well, I think that means that the organizational solutions have to come on the demand side. And fortunately, this is not rocket science. This is something that we can do easily. I think this is an example of some low-hanging fruit. Why don't we just keep track of who's in the IRB and make George do it occasionally? <laughs> Not that we'd want that, but, um, uh, and, and, or we could, we could rotate the tasks. Maybe we could actually start making these promotable, right? That maybe these should count. And so we have to change the way that we are asking people because right now we are putting the cost of women's underrepresentation on them themselves. Okay? And so we need to stop putting them in a no-win situation in which if they're, if they're asked and they say no, there could be a negative consequences. But if they say yes, that means a lot less time is spent on doing the promotable task. Okay. Thank you very much. Many of these situations, women 
are less common in universities in professor roles. So as a result, they end up taking on more of these sorts of tasks just because the amount of people you have to choose from yeah. is fewer. How do you think that this research would suggest we solve that sort of problem? Okay, yeah, this is easy to, to solve because there is a good reason maybe that, that women or minorities are asked to be on these committees. Their voices are important. Okay, but let's pay for it then. Let's not have it come out of my hide, right? Give me a reduced teaching load. Take me off tasks that are not so important that maybe representation of women and minorities is not so key, right? And so this is something we can do if organizations are willing to commit the resources for it. Uh, well, organizations aren't going to solve their problems. <laughs> uh, they're not going to get increased representation of women um, if, if they don't pay attention to this. This is not going to solve on its own because, like I said, you, this is something that really is not fair to ask to the individuals themselves to solve okay. because there may be consequences for me saying no. right now with 50 people, we are three women, so 50 people. and I feel like um, some of the things you presented before really resonate uh, for me, but the, the thing is also from multiple facts is that I think that because I'm one of the only women in the group, nobody asked me to do any of these things, because then I think it gets too obvious uh -huh. that, uh, you know, <laughs> so. <Yeah. laughs> I, I know that people like in academia don't history. worry so much about that, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you have, do you yeah. have any? Uh, I, don't have, I don't have any data on that, whether it's if the numbers are very, very small, whether the dynamic would yeah. change and it looks more like the single sex groups, um, I'm not sure. So we're happy to introduce our last speaker, Kate Glazebrook, who joins us from the Behavioral Insights team in the UK and has developed with um, a team a new tool to make it easier for organizations to go back to the previous question, make it easier for organizations to really level the playing field for men and women and people from all different origins. Kate. Thank you, Iris. Before I start, can I just get a show of hands of who here in this room has a CV or a resume, depending on where you are in the world? Okay, almost everyone, right? Um, and, and have you ever spent time sort of agonizing over what, what sits on sort of page two, the way that you described that job that you had a couple of years ago and what your work responsibilities were? Has anyone sort of spent time doing that? Yeah. So I've spent a lot of time on my CV over the years and agonized over various aspects of it. And um, over the last year, I've been spending some time together with Iris um, in the HR research and on how people make hiring decisions. And I'm going to give you a couple of pieces of data, which some of you may know, which is kind of startling. There's evidence that suggests that organizations spend as little as six seconds on your CV. <laughs> and if you believe the thin slicing of information literature, they spend about 15 seconds deciding whether they want to hire you when they come in for an interview, when you come in for an interview. So collectively, you're being assessed for about 21 seconds on whether or not you get a job. But we actually spend a lot of time in the background, right? And we spend a lot of time in organizations thinking about hiring decisions and administrating around hiring decisions. So we in the Behavioral Insights team have been spending a lot of um, our time working with organizations on how they do hiring and how we might be able to bring the best out of the research that people in this room right here have done themselves into technology. We spend most of our time in the Behavioral Insights team running field trials on people in the UK and abroad um, on a variety of issues. And my colleague Ariella here is, is doing some really interesting work with the police uh, in the UK on how we can increase sort of racial um, representation in the police forces in the UK. But one of the things that we discovered in our work was how hard it is for organizations to do best practice. So I'm gonna take you through a little bit of a journey of our last year and a half on this problem. Um, and present some results from our early experiments on how doing things differently can yield quite different results. So let's start here. Some increasingly uncontroversial facts, and thanks to this morning's session, I don't really need to spend much time on these things. The first is that the productivity of the top 1% really, really, really matters. Uh, some evidence suggests that the top 1% is 25 times as productive as the median employee. 
so you know when we heard um, from McKinsey almost 20 years ago talking about a war on talent I'd say we're pretty much still with the war on talent and the tech sector has been sort of the newest to add to that field on spending millions and millions of pounds and and dollars each year trying to attract the highest quality candidates we also know from research by people in this room that diversity pays, um, and it pays in a series of dimensions that, we, that matter for organisations, both commercial and moral. We also know that our System 2 interventions are not hugely well um, evidenced, and they're really, really hard to do, as Iris's work has, has shown. So have we been thinking about this problem using the wrong system? So, you know, to use Danny Kahneman's concept of System 1, System 2, uh, and some of Cass's most recent research on our kind of default to wanting to use system two interventions. We like the idea when we're told that there's a problem, that the best way of solving them is through information. We like the idea that we can be told the right way to do things and we'll kind of improve, improve from there. But actually quite often system one interventions are more, inter more effective than system two. So this is what I would consider to be the beginnings of what we're seeing as a system one intervention on hiring. Uh, across the UK, uh, we've had a number of organisations toward the end of last year join the Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron, in pledging to name-blind recruitment. Uh, and this is kind of what it's starting to look like. It's, uh, it's a process which we found was really, really painful. So this is, a, is it sort of a, a bit of a, a point of humility for us in the Behavioural Insights team. We have grown very quickly over the last couple of years and we were doing a lot of our own hiring. In the early days, we didn't have a lot of HR support, but we did know that there was 15 to 20 years worth of research showing that people with non-white sounding surnames are much less likely to get called back for interview. We know that women are less likely to be hired into male dominated roles and the reverse is also true. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't sort of falling prey to the same kinds of biases we see in many other organizations. So we started blinding our recruitment. We started taking things off CVs that we thought weren't relevant. And we started shuffling them out and giving them to different people in the team to kind of minimize the risk of idiosyncratic bias or stereotype bias. And sort of eight hours into this process, so this is a real photo of, of us sometime last year, we realized why people aren't doing it. <laughs> like, this is hard, it was painful. Like, I, I was printing, I was printing how many copies did I have and did I put them in the right piles? Once you've taken the name off, all of a sudden you have to make sure you're <laughs> actually putting the right person in the right pile, are you giving them to the, r to the right reviewer to review? And then once you've got the reviews back, are you putting painstakingly putting into a spreadsheet the right number next to the right person, because you know that part matters, right? So it was error prone, it was time consuming, and it was really hassly. We didn't, we didn't enjoy it. And we thought, well, if we're not enjoying it and we care about the outcome and we know the science, then it's pretty, pretty easy to understand why most other organizations aren't doing this well. So that's when we kind of embarked on, on a journey which has led to the creation of our first tech product in, um, in the Behavioral Insights team, we call it Applied. And we want to do three things with it. We want to make recruitment smart, we want to make it fair, and we want to make it easy. And we've worked with Iris over the last year and she's been hugely helpful in connecting us to the best research here and, and also bringing a level of pragmatism to taking the research out of journals and putting them into the hands of, of real people and real organisations. So what does it mean to make recruitment smart, fair and easy? Um, we have embedded in what we think are sort of five key features and I'm going to go through them fairly quickly because I think the underlying research behind them has sort of been well evidenced and mentioned a lot this morning already. The first is anonymization. That's the low-hanging fruit. It's really important, but we know it matters and it's pretty clear that my name has no correlation to whether or not I'm good at my job, so let's just take off anything that we think is irrelevant to whether or not I'm good at my job but might be inadvertently standing in the way of my likelihood of getting a job. So anonymization was the first piece. But once we started there, we thought, well, you're in, you're in technology zone. You can do all kinds of things with technology rather than just taking off information. You can also just change the way people view information. And that's when we kind of came to how would we reshape the choice architecture of hiring to improve diversity and, and fairness in recruitment. And that's when we settled on chunking. Um, chunking is doing nothing more than changing the default from a vertical to a horizontal read. So this allows us to do two things. So rather than taking CVs one after the other with cover letters and reading Phil's top to bottom, Iris's top to bottom, Linda's top to bottom, and you kind of forget who was good at the first question that you asked them, why not just get people to read first question uh, comparatively? And this, and this draws on Iris's own research on the different kinds of decisions we make when we're asked to make comparative choices. So we minimize the risk of halo effects in this environment because 
I'm less likely when it's anonymized to think that your answer to question one, which was fantastic, is affecting how I think your question three was. It also does another thing, which is about comparison friction. So for those of you who spend a lot of time thinking about choice overload in hiring decisions, it's much easier if you can break decisions up into single dimensions, and it's easier to then determine who was good at answering question one, and I'll just ignore questions two through seven, just looking at question one now. And actually, interestingly, when we have conversations with organisations that have anything to do with education, they nod like very readily. They think, well, this is how we do a lot of the things that we do in education. We take names off, we use exam numbers, we also tend to break up exams when we're, when we're reviewing them because it's actually just cognitively easier to look at answers to one question at once. So it's just doing that in a hiring setting, actually. The third thing was about harnessing the crowd. And I'm not going to uh, go into great depth about the vast depth of research showing that if you hand out uh, evaluations to multiple people, often lay people, they do better than one person alone would and often better than experts. So we wanted to know, in a recruitment setting, how do you harness the crowd to improve the objectivity of your decision making? Um, and on our website, you can have a look at a blog post that we did on testing exactly that. We chucked out uh, a series of responses to 400 MTurkers and got them to review them. And then we ran simulation modeling to find out where's the optimal point uh, for recruitment uh, and what's the optimal size of your review team. Now we settled on three, that's where we found there was the greatest gain in sort of judgmental accuracy from that extra person's perspective, while also recognising that each person you ask to read a piece of information takes them time and time is money for organisations. So, so long as they're making those, in those assessments independently, with three people you're going to get a pretty, good, a pretty good chance of not discarding your best candidate inadvertently because everybody sees people, things slightly differently. So we sort of stopped here and we thought, well, this does what we think is a pretty good job of the heavy lifting of really low-hanging fruit on improving diversity in recruitment decisions. We like to think that put together, these three things would do a reasonable job of making sure that each individual who comes through a recruitment practice is seen on, on merit. But organisations also care about whether they're making smarter recruitment decisions, not just fairer recruitment decisions. And that's when we went back to the literature on what is predictive of success on the role. And that's when we came back to CVs. There's not a whole lot of evidence that what sits on your CV is going to be helpful in deciding whether you're good at your job. There's a lot of information in your CV, no doubt, and a lot of that information may contain uh, information beneath that which tells you whether or not you're going to be good at your job, but the proxy alone is not great. In fact, if you look in depth at the research on what is predictive of success in the role, actually a lot of the things that sit on your CV are just distractions. If we wanted to do a better job of doing predictive recruitment, we needed to start testing people on what they actually do on the job. So using work tests and structured interviews do a much better job than unstructured interviews in reducing the risk of bias, but also increasing your chance of finding a person who's truly going to succeed in the role. Finally, we came back to people analytics, and it's kind of a, a buzz phrase that I think a lot of you will have heard in the, in the HR practice, but really it the, it's the idea of bringing data to bear on people decisions. Google's done a phenomenal job under the, the, the kind of um, leadership of Laszlo Bock and others on bringing kind of a truly forensic look at how, who you've hired, how you've hired them, whether they're successful in the role, and how you might be able to use that to iterate and improve the feedback loop between performance and hiring. So these are the five things that we built into Applied. But what I really want to tell you about is how we think it performs relative to a business as usual approach. So we wanted to test our hypotheses. We'd, we'd spent the better part of six or seven months um, building technology that we thought did all of these things. But as those of you who've worked in the tech sector can know, you can do phenomenal work and then ultimately what you've done never really works. So we tested it against uh, a business as usual approach, which was given to us by the fact that we were hiring a graduate round into the team, which meant we suddenly had sample sizes to be able to test them against. So here's how we set it up. We had 700 candidates apply and they did a multiple choice test through Applied, it was a timed test. They also answered five work-related questions in the form of a sort of work test, work sample test, and they gave us their CVs. What this allowed us to do is take the best 160 candidates based on their multiple choice tests and run two parallel sifting processes. 
So in the team, we had some senior members of the team take the CVs and rate the CVs in a granular way based on the things that we would typically have been looking for in the behavioural insights team. So we were looking for people with certain types of degree backgrounds, uh, kind of work experience that we would we might have been looking for, as well as a discretionary category for, yeah, they don't have a degree I'd been looking for, but they on the side had been studying behavioural sciences or decision sciences, or they had something special that we thought might be worth seeing. We also had a separate group of people in the team rate their responses on these work-related tests using all of the features that I've described before. So it was anonymised, it was chunked. Um, there were three reviewers on every single response. We then brought through the best performers out of each of those processes into an assessment centre. We gave them final interviews and then we made some offers. Now, you might ask yourself why, for those of you who know the Behavioural Insights team, we are obsessed with randomised control trials. We've run something in the order of 280 of them across most areas of public policy over the last few years. But uh, if anyone is a labour lawyer in the, in the room, you'll know that it's really hard to run randomised control trials on recruitment. It's, it's basically difficult. My, the lawyer in my team went blue in the face when I suggested we do this. So we instead decided to run this parallel process which allowed us to sort of construct three different groups. Now the first group is basically your high CV group. They got through because their CVs were phenomenal. The second group is the ones that were highly rated by other people in the team through applied on their work-related questions. And the third group was a, an overlap group, so they would have gotten through whichever process we'd used. So here are the results on which of those two processes did a better job of predicting performance in later rounds of recruitment. This scatter plot shows you on the x-axis their score on applied, so their score on their work-related questions. On the y-axis, we have their performance in the assessment centre. Now, these two processes were blinded from one another, so no one in the assessment centre knew how they'd performed earlier, and that's important, obviously. Uh, for those of you with good eyesight, you'll notice that there appears to be a positive correlation there, and in fact, it was a very statistically significant positive correlation between their performance in these two tasks. Quite different, in fact, because the assessment centre was all in person, and it was over about three to four hours testing negotiation skills, performance in, uh, in behavioural insights type questions and also sort of a speed test um, with multiple reviewers. So the real test is how did that then perform relative to a CV approach and these were the data that we saw. Don't overinterpret for those of you who can see closely that's not a significant p-value that just says that it's about as good as random. The, the score that we'd given a CV was not at all a predictor of how well they performed in the assessment centre. We saw similar results when we compared how they'd performed in the final interview. Now, obviously, you get to small samples here, so be a little wary with the data. But what we ultimately discovered is that of the 12 that we finally hired, 60% of them we wouldn't have hired if we just looked at their CVs. And of the top five performing in all of our recruitment practices, three of them we wouldn't have hired. When we re-ran the analysis, we discovered we would have had to have looked at about three times as many CVs to have obtained as many high performers across all of the processes. And we discovered directional support, though not statistically significant support, for having more diverse candidates come through the applied approach than we would have done had it been um, a CV approach. Interestingly, not on gender, where we found no real bias in either process, um, but we found much stronger directional support for educational and attainment backgrounds. So we were more likely to take uh, candidates who'd had different kinds of educational backgrounds and who hadn't gotten a first from a fancy university, as, a, as an example. So this was really just the first um, amongst what we hope to be a many, um, many and great series of experiments that we'll do through Applied with organisations on ways of testing different approaches that embed the best of the behavioural insights that we see from people in this room and elsewhere into technology. And I look forward to working with you on that. Thanks. Thank you to all of the presenters very much. We now have about 15 minutes for Q&A, comments, thoughts, questions, ideas for other different kinds of work. There's a question for Kate, but even for you, yours, for any of you. When we think about the anonymization, since most organizations hiring are not there yet and are not doing this, um, 
would one infer as a candidate that you should anonymize your own CV as in remove all identifiers of racial or gen, you know, sort of gender associated organizations in which you participated, which would possibly be quite provocative and offensive to those populations. But one could infer that might be, gender might be harder to, to sort of remove, but the average person involved in an African American, a Latino, whatever organization, if their name alone is not indicative, would this indicate they're better off removing that kind of identifier information? Or LGBT, if that were the case, like whatever those kinds of participate uh, organizations. Um, a really, really important question. I think, so there's some really interesting research that's just come out on uh, sort of whiteifying your name and the, the kind of backlash effects that can happen there. So they tested, I might get the specifics wrong, so if anyone else knows this study um, better than I do, please step in. But it basically showed that organisations that promote diversity are more likely to attract people who don't change their name from what might be an ethnic sounding name to their kind of what could be construed as their American name underneath that. So they thought, well, they promote diversity, so I should definitely be comfortable using my, my, my kind of original name. It turns out that they're actually less likely to be hired by those organisations than they would if they didn't. So it, it get, you get yourself into some seriously thorny questions about what's the responsibility of the individual versus what's the responsibility of the firm. And, and I think I'd, I'd sit on the, on the side that I think Iris and I have talked about many times, which which is this, this is hugely difficult and it's probably not up to individuals to be changing the structure one, per, one application at a time, rather it's on the side of the organisation that cares and authentically wants to care about these issues to change their processes to make it easier for those people to be successful. Just to, I mean, I agree with everything you said, Kate, but uh, just to add to that, uh, we also uh, run into a problem that we sometimes refer to as selection bias, meaning so who are the people who will use your strategy and what you know what 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 does this tell me about these people and so it's, it's very difficult for organizations also I'm not trying to defend organizations but just you know to, to draw inferences on the strategy and I I need to tell you about one study which um, I think for both Kate and me was a bit of a shock when we learned about it early on but which is explainable in terms of selection bias again and that's in France, interestingly enough. Um, there is a central agency which helps, uh, basically is a matchmaker between companies and people who look for a job. And they offered companies the option for them, for this agency, to blind the companies to the names, and not just the names, the addresses of the applicants. And it turned out that they found what Kate just described, that because companies self-selected into this process, it actually was the companies which already cared more about diversity which self-selected into the blinding process, and that backfired, and they then ended up hiring fewer um, people of uh, diverse backgrounds. So I think we always have to worry about that particular, so whenever we have that selection going on, whether it is on the side of the applicants or the organizations, there's additional things going on that we don't, we don't have a good handle on. You know, who is it who is going to do that? And I, I think that would probably also complicate the process. But although, I mean, I love the thought experiment. I mean, I, I love the idea of kind of, you know, of doing it, you know, uh, although agreeing with Kate that it shouldn't be the responsibility sure. of the individual to have to do that. Other questions, comments? Yes, please. Thank you. Actually, I have a question that, that was inspired by the, the story about the unpublished research that Catherine and Evan were talking about earlier this morning. Um, so I was wondering if there's any evidence to the impact of diversity on the cohesiveness of teams and, and team settings. Because I guess uh, you were looking at a situation where in the lab it was clear what the right answer to the task given was. Um, and I was wondering if in a more heterogeneous setting it was easier to build a cohesive team that maybe in the real world would then also be more prone to putting in the extra hour to go out for a beer, to just feel like they're doing good creative work. So when we're talking about diversity on the bottom line, you know, what, what kind of real world evidence do we have uh, about the problem solving of diverse teams? There was a lot in your question, but I think I got it. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This, doesn't really, this doesn't really do anything. Loud, it just okay. makes, uh, sure you got it. Got it. So, so the relationship between cohesion and outcomes uh, in teams actually suggests that there is some correlation between having a cohesive team and, and performing well. There's a question of which arrow, which direction does the arrow go? Does it, does it mean that uh, more cohesive groups perform better? 
or that once a group performs really well, they become more cohesive over time. Um, and so the, the research that, that I've done and that you know, I've done with Evan in the laboratory that helps us to understand what the process is that's happening in those groups um, cannot really tell us over time what happens, what, what is the cycle of that cohesion and, and performance outcomes, for instance. We also know, though, that um, people don't like to be in groups that they're not having some level of fun with. Right? So they, they want to be comfortable in the teams that they're in. Uh, and so you should actually really be thinking about both not only the, the performance outcome, but also kind of things like satisfaction um, and, and commitment and kind of willingness to, to, um, to stay in the teams. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but. Well, I was just wondering if there's, if there's any real world randomized evidence that would speak to such things that follows people over a longer term where maybe one hiring process was actually focused on getting a diverse hire and another wasn't, where we could really compare like examples of, of overtime outcomes. Yep. So there's a, there's a couple of studies that have done over time, things over time. The study that you're describing has not been done. I'm very happy. I think Evan would also be happy to raise his hand and say if there's anyone here in the room who would like to work with us to help us collect that kind of data, we'd be super happy to do that. You can imagine, um, like many others have said here, sometimes you go to organizations and you want to do exactly that and they're sometimes hesitant to do it um, because they may not really want to know what the answer is. Um, I will say, though, that there are a couple of studies that have done teams in, in um, classroom settings over time, maybe followed them over the course of a semester, for instance. There's one in particular I'm thinking about that's Watson, Kumar, and Michelson from like the 1990s that basically shows that over time, when you first look at diverse and homogeneous groups, that homogeneous groups tend to outperform diverse ones in the beginning, but that over time, the gap between homogeneous and diverse groups closes, and that diverse groups tend to outperform on some measures measures the homogeneous groups at the end of the semester on the final assignment. And so there is some evidence that it takes time, it takes more time for diverse groups to kind of get up to speed, that they don't have the luxury of that initial trust and, and cohesion that you might have when you walk into a room of people who look like you. Does that help? Yeah, great. Hello, I don't know if I need a microphone, I hope I can be heard. Um, I guess it's a it's going to a point that Linda, sorry, down there that you were making. I just wonder in the, um, the study that you did whether or not there was a difference between the way men or women female bosses allocated those promotable versus non-promotable tasks to men and women in their team and whether or not there was a perception difference by male and female bosses as to what was a promotable versus a non-promotable task. Yeah, so in the study that we did, we didn't see, you know, when, when, when the participant's job was to ask someone to do the task, we didn't see that female participants were any different than male participants. Both male and female participants asked the woman more than the man, um, in part because they expected her to agree more to do it uh, than, than did the, the male. Uh, your second question, I, I think, is really interesting as well. Um, that are, is there differences in how people view what's promotable and what's not, and that's uh, that's not something that we've done yet. But I, I think um, you know could be could be a factor, you know, uh, in, uh, in in trying to understand the phenomenon. Mm. Well, I mean, everything you said there is so something I would say that certainly I work in a large government organisation, and we definitely experience everything that you said. And as a female, I definitely experience all of those things that you talked about including the fact that as a woman I am more likely to get more administrative tasks given to me and whether or not that's a combination of things that I'll probably just comply and just do it and just get it done in an efficient way as well. Um, but but ha having said that, my personal perception is that a man will probably not place value in those tasks but a female manager who also has lived through being given those more administrative tasks to do will still perceive value and understand the effort that you have gone to. But the problem is, of course, people promote in their own light. And so you have men who promote men or women who might have um, potentially characteristic personality types that might be more aggressive or dominant, so come through like that anyway. So. And, and that's where really understanding what goes into the evaluation of performance. Um, and, you know, we've drawn this clear line between promotable and non-promotable, and clearly there's lots of things in between um, that might matter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question for Linda. 
Uh, given your findings, the difference between the single sex and the mixed uh, groups, um, should policymakers make a plea for single sex schools in order to reduce the stereotypical <laughs> expectations that we have uh, and that the, the well, roles we, we take on? I, I think the issues of school is, is, is a very different question because it might be about the dynamics of learning in single sex versus mixed sex schools, which I think is really different from what we're talking about here. I mean, I think basically what we're thinking about this phenomenon, it's just all driven by, you know, you, you, have, you have something that you need to have done. I'm going to ask Iris, <laughs> right? She's going to say yes. And, and that's a really different mechanism than something um, well, about, about schools. In schools, the teacher yeah. asks the girls to, to go and get her, her or him a glass of water. Yeah. That's I, I what I'm saying. Yeah. If it's only girls, yeah. there's no, no stereotype. But I, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure that the, the really important factors that people talk about in terms of education are really at, at play here in, in what we're doing. In addition, I'm actually going to ask, I had my own question. Um, we're getting back to Will's work, right, with the intergroup contact theory, which suggests that maybe creating mixed learning environments, including in schools, might have other other benefits. I don't know what you can speak, but I know you've done a lot on education, whether you can speak to that at all. But uh, I think that this intergroup contact um, theory and finding that you have, it could be very promising on the one hand, right? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I don't have a lot to add over the very well phrased question, which presupposes the answer. So I, I think that is one of the justifications for having more mixed groups, particularly in school, is that, uh, that people get used to it and you start to think of uh, other groups as being individuals rather than as a stereotype. Uh, so I, that would be the main justification, but with that said, we don't have great evidence on that one way or the other at the school level. Um, but there is some good work coming out of the developing countries now that would be consistent with that. So there's some really great work in India that uh, when you have um, more kids who are brought into an elite school or are, are scholarship kids, that changes the way that the sort of elite kids view uh, kids from poor neighborhoods and, and those ethnic groups and those castes. So I think it's consistent with that uh, kind of explanation. Does it also affect their performance? Uh, there, not negatively, which is usually the way that people think about it. So there's no evidence that it hurts the rich kids. Um, but that's, there's certainly no evidence that it helps them either. Okay, uh, I think one last question and then we'll um, go and have lunch. Thank you. Uh, the question is for Kate, actually, in terms of the experiment that you've run. Is there any intention to carry on looking at the people that were employed and actually look at their actual performance in, in doing the roles that you've um, you know, that you're looking to do, and then look back and see if that then follows through. Yeah, it's it, it's a it's an excellent question because what I showed you obviously is what correlates with performance in later parts of a recruitment round, not do they actually perform better on the job. As it turns out, we only have 10 of them that have come. They're literally moving into the team at the moment and every time they start, I have to say, by the way, I'm telling other people outside of this organization what experiment we ran on you when, when you were being recruited. They, they seem reasonably relaxed about it, I suppose, by, by its very nature they got through so that they don't really care. Um, they don't know for, for what it's worth, they don't know which group they were in, only me and my, my research um, assistant do know. We won't get statistical significance out of 10, um, 10 people anyway, but we will be performance assessing them anyway. But the, the real hope is that the next major experiment we can do, we'll be able to connect that full feedback loop between performance assessment. Now, for those of you in the room who've, who've also read into the performance assessment field, you'll know you'd be as worried about performance assessment as you would about recruitment and selection. So it's, it's important that in that process, we're doing the best job we can of getting underneath true performance, not just you know, all the problems around self-report or I'm more likely to promote myself, et cetera, et cetera. So setting that up is going to be crucial. With that, um, thank you very much to our presenters and thank you to all of you. Um, we have lunch now and um, I'm sure we have wonderful helpers who can help us uh, find our way to lunch and then back to our sessions. And thank you all very much. <laughs>